Well, 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 I think that means that we are now live and streaming and I want to welcome everybody to this chat that I'm having with Alex Ross, who is um, one of the best known and most admired writers on music from America and across the world. He's been a staffer on New the New Yorker for the best part of a quarter of a century, wrote the brilliant The Rest is silence, uh, listening in the 20th well, century. Well, well, I think that means Oh, that I'm hearing my own voice back now. And I want to welcome Are you hearing it too? To this chat. I am I'm having a very... With Alex Ross, who is... Um, I'm having a very distressing error here. Yeah. I'm going to have to... <laughs> I'm going to have to... Wow, that's horrible. I hope Robin is listening, who's our host. It's uh, recorded an infinite boost. We, am I doing this too? Am I being echoed into infinity? Oh, I'm hearing my own voice back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is freakish. Um, what's going on? We've got a little notice here. I'm having a very distressing error here. I need to close YouTube, I'm being told. Have I got YouTube open? I hope we're listening to our host. No, I haven't got you. Is that better? Yes, that's better. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. How extraordinary. I do apologize, everybody. If that was my fault, it just shows, you see, I paint myself to some people, at least as some kind of tech wizard, and I'm as hopeless as hopeless can be. Anyway, now welcome. I was introducing Alex Ross, a New Yorker music writer, and his new book, Wagnerism, uh, I think the subtitle, I, I got it right, is... is um, uh, art and music, I'm uh, sorry, art and politics in the shadow of music. Um, now I have been a, a lover of Wagner, or at least a, a baffled and sometimes confused lover of Wagner uh, for most of my life, uh, and I have read a lot of books on the subject. There are so many books written on him. I'm told there are more on him than there are on Napoleon and even more than on Shakespeare, which seems hard to believe. But anyway, the point is there's a vast literature. But I have to say, in all honesty, and it's the reason I'm here, this is the best book on Wagner I have ever read. Um, it is magnificent. It's not a biography. It's not a, a, a musical study. It's far more important, really. It's a study of the influence of Wagner in all corners of cultural life. It's an it's a tour de force as a piece of writing, and it's. Uh, I promise you, if you if you, uh, if you get it and read it, you will be uh, absolutely hooked. Because whatever one's view of Wagner, and this is obviously something we're going to come come to. Um, it is impossible to ignore the shadow he cast over the 20th and 21st centuries. No comparable figure exists, perhaps in all of, of uh, human culture, certainly in the West that we know of, uh, who has been such an influence, not always a, a positive one. I mean, he was an influence in as much as uh, people worked and wrote against him and tried their very best to escape the influence, which is another form. Stravinsky, for example, I suppose you could say, was devoted to the idea of not being like Wagner, which is a kind of influence. Anyway, um, I'm, I don't want to talk too much because Alex will have so much interesting to say. So I want to ask you first, Alex, if I may, what was it, how long was this in gestation as a book? Is it something you've been preparing for decades? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I'm utterly bowled over by that by that uh, praise, and and uh, it's wonderful to be um, chatting with you since I've uh, followed your work on Wagner and oh. in other media um, uh, for a long time. But uh, yeah, this this was a a long gestating project. I mean, the actual work of researching and writing it uh, took about ten years. Uh, before that, I suppose I was consciously or unconsciously gathering a string. Uh, and I found myself, uh, while I was working on The Rest is Noise, my first book, Wagner kept intruding. Uh, he kept sort of um, uh, poking his head in and sort of casting a shadow in one way or another um, to, the, to the point that I was t making these detours, perhaps unnecessary detours, uh, sort of into uh, the realm of, of Wagner as I worked in that book, whether it was his uh, enormous influence on music at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, or of course in the chapter on uh, music in Nazi Germany, uh, he kept um, <clears throat> becoming more and more of a factor. And so this, this sort of distraction uh, uh, pointed, I think sort of guided me toward my next uh, big uh, uh, subject. There was just something there which I was uh, uh, um, 
fascinated by and, and sort of couldn't turn away from. But sort of long before that, I was, uh, since I was um, a teenager, I suppose, I've been uh, fascinated perhaps in an unhealthy way <laughs> by uh, this period of the fin de siècle, you know, the end of 19th, early 20th century. Sort of almost everything that emanates from this period musically, culturally, historically uh, uh, has, has just long uh, obsessed me. Um, and Wagner is, was so omnipresent uh, in that period that uh, writing this book was sort of both a way to, to deal with Wagner in a, in a perhaps slightly fresh or unusual way, not a biographical study, not one of these thousands of books, some of which are behind me here. Um, it, but it was also allowed me to immerse myself once again uh, in this epic uh, that, that has just long been uh, uh, so, so close to me. And, and, and so just following this Wagner thread uh, through the period she sort of gave me a sense of sort of a, a fresh perspective on so many of the celebrated artists and, and writers in this period, so many of whom were affected to one degree or another by Wagner. And not just musicians, of course, but painters and uh, poets and novelists uh, as well. And, and I suppose there is, I can't think of many composers in what we call the classical tradition, uh, about whom one could say everybody has a problem with them. I mean, there is a Wagner problem. Um, right. uh, the most obvious one, uh, I speak as a Jew myself, is the anti-Semitism, uh, which is unmistakable and hard to avoid. And of course, the taint of, of Nazism. Of course, he died 50 years before uh, Hitler became chancellor. But nonetheless, there is an association in most people's minds and in the citizens of Israel and, and so on of, long had a, a, a natural problem with him. But there's also another problem, which is really with the power of his music, many people find almost obscene. You know, Clara Schumann and many others who are contemporary wrote about this, that, that it has an effect on one that is almost cheating. It seems to short circuit the, 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 the proper logical way that art sh should work. Even the most emotional romantic art uh, ought to earn its way into your soul and into your heart. Whereas this has a visceral and a, a, a complete power over many listeners that can be laughed at, as many Wagnerians were scoffed uh, in, in their time uh, and considered pretentious and absurd because of their weeping and their wailing and their gasps of ecstasy. Um, uh, or, or, or it can um, it can seem literally dangerous that you abandon some part of yourself in a way that is akin to drugs or something else that people might disapprove of. And th this was one of the very first objections to Wagner, wasn't it? Yeah, it was both the it was a, a objection early on, but it was also the very root of this phenomenon uh, that came to be called Wagnerism, this experience of being overwhelmed by Wagner and inflamed by Wagner, and somehow that, that he, he, he propels you uh, in some unexpected new direction. Um, but you're quite right. I mean, the, you know, when people talked about the threat or, or some sort of you know, sinister aspect of Wagner uh, early on, it wasn't so much uh, the anti-Semitism, which uh, very early on was, was uh, uh, not widely known, the, the mm -hmm. uh, Judaism music essay having been published uh, anonymously uh, in 1850. But it, it was this, it was the sense that the, this, this music somehow um, uh, gets under our skin uh, to a dangerous degree, it, it uh, triggers uh, uh, dangerous energies. There was a lot of focus on, on Wagner's uh, eroticism, uh, uh, on the idea that, that somehow he was um, dangerous for, for uh, young women or, or young men as well, I suppose. Um, uh, also this association with you know, German power um, and, and sort of the, the, the threat of sort of the, the burgeoning uh, German nation. But exactly the same effect was what Baudelaire, for example, um, celebrated in his 1861 essay, Richard Wagner and Tannhäuser in Paris, which, which is really the, the, uh, the sort of ground zero of Wagnerism uh, as, as I see it. Uh, before uh, Nietzsche, um, uh, Baudelaire uh, reported being uh, uh, overwhelmed by, by Wagner, invaded uh, by Wagner, uh, penetrated by Wagner, he said. Um, but, but at the same time, uh, he, he felt this to be a joyous experience. You know, it, it wasn't problematic at all for him. He, he, he wanted uh, to be in and, 
and narcotized uh, by art in this way. And then what's, what's very interesting about what happens with Baudelaire and a number of these other French uh, uh, Wagnerians uh, in the later 19th century and into the 20th. Um, it's not that they fall under Wagner's spell and do his bidding. Um, it's much more that that the you know at the end of this process of this very intense engagement, they emerge with their own Wagner. Uh, they really take him over and appropriate him, uh, reinvent him into something uh, quite unrecognizable uh, from, from the sort of reception of Wagner that existed before. Uh, so you have this you know, Wagner of the dream state, uh, of the stream of consciousness, of, uh, of the sort of welling up of, the, of these, of these uh, uh, intense erotic uh, energies. Uh, Baudelaire talked about a, a sensation of Satanism <laughs> in oh, China, was there, which is not to be found in, in <clears throat> Wagner's own uh, commentaries on his you know, intentions. Well, so the sort of vaporous poison. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, okay. so you have this emergence of this, you know, uh, uh, sort of strains of, of Satanism and occultism and, and uh, um, esotericism uh, being being attached to to Wagner in, in quite surprising ways. So this is this is sort of how the the phenomenon unfolds. But for other people, it was it was unnerving, you know, to to have music that has such sensational, visceral um, uh, impact. It just kind of it didn't behave at all the way the way works of of, of previous eras had had behaved. There there was something. Um, um, uh, uh, overwhelming, you yeah. know, about the impact of it. I, I wonder if, like me, you, you, when you think of Wagner uh, in the, on an average day, and you think of a, a, a bombastic bore who, who, of whom you're tired, and, and then the moment a bar of Parsifal or Tristan <laughs> comes on, and you start to listen, every you remember why it is that he has such power over you that that, that, it, that he ought not to just because he was, he was such a, 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 a prolix and bombastic writer and so full of himself and so kind of mostly mean to people. He had a rather impish, gleeful sense of humor, which was often cruel. Um, the way he treated the young Nietzsche, for example, makes you forgive Nietzsche for all his later recantation of Wagnerism. And, um, and, and there is a you know a real sense that uh, th he's the perfect way of approaching the the eternal question of the gap between the fruits of the tree and the ugliness of the tree. You know, he, he was a very ugly tree from which the most extraordinary fruits fell. Yeah. And is, is it all right to ignore him, uh, the man, and say that his art is actually something quite aside from him? Yeah, I, I never really. Sort of attempted to make that sort of total separation of the art and artist with with Wagner. I mean, I feel there's sort of no way of of ignoring it. And the whole point, I think, of this artwork is is not to take you into some pure uh, ethereal upper sphere. Um, the 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 work has has always been. I mean, at least for me, um, intensely psychological, uh, intensely political. Um, not always clear what the political ramifications are, but it just feels as though Wagner attaches himself, the work attaches itself to whatever is going on around us right now. And you know, at every stage of history and in, in different countries, Wagner has had this, this adhesive effect. And then when you look at how Wagner is used in Hollywood and, and how he seems to somehow uh, chime with and, and blend in with this, this extraordinary variety of images. So it's just, it's never been sort of something uh, apart for me and, and my own history coming to terms with Wagner was, was um, uh, sort of a slow process, uh, uh, initial phase of, of really having a quite adverse uh, reaction to him. I just remember when I was a kid, uh, I, I was very accustomed to uh, Mozart and, and Beethoven and, and, and Brahms, and the first time I listened to Wagner, it just sounded like this, this soup, this this kind of gas cloud of, of ideas, kind of floating around and blending into each other. And I find it an unappetizing experience. And then by the time I was in university, uh, I was very very much steeped in in European uh, 
history and, and, and culture of the late, late 19th, early 20th centuries. And I was extremely aware of Wagner's anti-Semitism uh, and his uh, uh, nefarious political ramifications. And so I was viewing Wagner very much through, you know, just purely as a problem, a kind of problem of, of intellectual history. And it wasn't until somewhat later uh, that I found a more personal relationship with the music. And so just, you know, from the start, um, it's, it's just, it's just all been packed together. It's just been sort of, you know, Wagner, his life, uh, the, the, the context in which his, his work came into being, and then sort of all the subsequent history is just, and this actually makes it just more interesting. In fact, it's, it's sometimes very alarming. It's deeply unsettling uh, to confront all these different ways in which Wagner uh, has been used. Uh, but for me, this is, this is what my own relationship with, with music and, and with art is like, I always want to know the context, you know, just when I was a kid, I would just always be reading biographies and listening to sort of records or some kind of pompous narrator was telling the <laughs> composer's life story, you know, over the music. And I just, you know, I, I just, I just always wanted to know how the music is, is related to the society uh, around it. And this has been kind of- related. And of course, in, in, in his own writings, he, he, correctly noted that by using mythology there was you were never going to go into a dated world mm -hmm. that it was always going to be fresh and always going to be accessible because it was outside his own time and therefore can be appropriated to any time which is one of the the great tricks isn't it oh, I think. yeah this is what he did at the end of the 1840s is this sort of turn from history to myth, which can be oversimplified when, when you look at sort of the uh, you know, sort of mythic and legendary uh, ideas were sort of uh, very important to Wagner from the outset. But, but he did make this very deliberate decision with the, uh, as he said, to work on the ring cycle um, to step far back from history uh, and to address these, these universal uh, mythic themes as a way of, of ensuring, in fact, that this work would would always be relevant would would always sort of uh, speak to uh, uh, listeners of different worlds and, and, and different times and he got that exactly right I mean this is the sort of really really the reason uh, if there is one reason why this phenomenon uh, Wagnerism took off I think it, it is his virtuosity um, in in deploying these mythic uh, archetypes and, and weaving together mythic ideas from different traditions, because you know the ring is not just Norse gods. Uh, uh, there 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 are many different stories uh, interwoven, and of course, once you get to Parsifal, uh, yes. you know uh, um, uh, master goulash of, <laughs> of Arthurian religious all kinds of things. I, I want you to let the um, let the viewers uh, know. I've got here the, the 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 list of the chapters because it, um, it 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 describes so many of the different cultural areas that you go down. The little um, the sort of magisteria, the kingdoms, the realms that you. Um, you chapter one is Rheingold, Wagner, and Nietzsche, and the Ring, but that's a huge subject on its own, of course. Then you have a chapter called Tristan, called Baudelaire and the Symbolists. You've already mentioned Baudelaire's famous uh, essay and. Swan Knight, Victorian Britain and Gilded Age America, because that's a whole other side, uh, which again is fully influenced by Wagner. Grail Temple, Esoteric Decadent and Satanic Wagner, Holy German Art, the Kaiserreich and Fantasiette of Vienna, Nibelheim, Jewish and Black Wagner, Venusberg, Feminist and Gay Wagner, Brunhilde's Rock, uh, uh, Villa Cather and the Singer Novel, Magic Fire Modernism, 1900 to 1940, Notung, First World War and Hitler's Youth, The Ring of Power, Revolution in Russia, Flying Dutchman, Ulysses, The Wasteland, The Waves, uh, Siegfried's Death, Nazi Germany and Thomas Mann, Ride of the Valkyries film, From Birth of a Nation to Apocalypse Now, and then finally The Wound, Wagnerism after 1945. So uh, people can get an idea there of just uh, how, how, what a wonderful series of adventures they're in for in reading this. Um, for example, uh, what you, you uh, just, let's start out of order, but the Ulysses, the Wasteland and the Waves, those are obviously three gigantic in, in the English language, at least, landmarks in, in literary modernism, James Joyce and uh, T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf. Um, and you, the obvious connection, I suppose, might be 
with Virginia Woolf and James Joyce, something to do with the internal monologue of the, you know, the stream of consciousness, as it's called. Uh, um, and T.S. Eliot famously begins with Wagnerian, you know, Erden Lerdes Man, Frisch Rate der Wind and Weile La 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 and other Wagnerian gobbits. And I, I wonder what it was that you, that you thought appealed to these young and extraordinarily gifted writers, what they saw in Wagner. Especially remembering, and this is an odd point, but I think it's an important one. They didn't really have the chance that we have to listen and listen and listen and listen. They, they wouldn't have had the whole ring available to them. They wouldn't have had the whole of Tristan available to them. They might have had a few 75s, uh, I suppose, as, as we call 78s, I mean, as we call them, those old scratchy records. But they, they must have obviously reacted very strongly. Uh, and I wonder what it was that, that made Wagner, of all, so important to these literary figures. Yeah, well, this chapter was was very important to me. I felt it was sort of almost the, the culmination of the story that I was telling, because in a lot of ways, I am talking about sort of Wagner as as the background to as a sort of conduit for modernism and sort of yeah. the, the emergence of the modern world and modern culture in, in many different forms. Uh, and so this is where you know the, the transition really is complete. Um, and it is actually a moment in which you know Wagner's cultural power is fading, uh, you know, in the 1920s um, and into the early 30s, uh, sort of the, the period in which these these um, uh, three uh, great works appeared, uh, The Wasteland, Ulysses, uh, and The Waves, and I had tack on uh, Finnegan's Wake uh, as well. Yeah. Just because <laughs> yes. That's not enough, you have to throw in Finnegan's Wake as well. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, sort of, you know, it's it's the twenties, it's the jazz age, and and the sort of this this grand lumbering uh, figure of the Romantic era sort of no longer has the, the conjuring power that that he that he once had, and also sort of the the First World War has cast a, a great shadow over formerly revered uh, German culture, sort of Germany being increasingly uh, identified with uh, aggression. And, and so there's sort of a falling off of, of, uh, of sort of everything uh, uh, German, especially in the, in the um, English speaking world. Uh, and yet these, these writers belong to the generation that, you know, in their youth before the First World War, Wagner was just absolutely unavoidable. And you just couldn't really be an uh, intellectual sort of cultured young person without having some kind of relationship with Wagner, some kind of stance. It could be one of just total rejection uh, or it could be some, some very sort of complicated relationship. But, but just as with sort of being a young person in the 60s, you know, you just sort of had to have a take on Bob Dylan and, and, and the Beatles. And so sort of Wagner was just so ubiquitous. And, and sort of the pattern is generally that that's, that an early period of infatuation, sort of you know, fashionable immersion in Wagner. Um, and this happens especially with uh, Joyce and Eliot, uh, a little less so with, with Wolf, who was always somewhat ambivalent. Um, and then there's a sort of a pulling away uh, and sort of as the sort of the maturation process uh, sets in, uh, Wagner is sort of put at arm's length along with sort of everything else, you know, from the Victorian era, the, the Edwardian era, uh, from sort of the whole Romantic age. Um, sort of one must sort of put this uh, uh, behind one. And yet these Wagnerian resonances and echoes linger very strongly, uh, whether in the wasteland, which sort of depicts the whole mindset really of a, of a kind of decadent aesthete, uh, you know, in the years before the First World War, or in Ulysses, where, uh, Joyce is, is really sort of caricaturing himself, a sort of younger version of himself in Stephen Dedalus uh, as this young man who sort of waves his walking stick around, uh, the walking <laughs> stick itself being an affectation, pretending that it's Notum, uh, Siegfried's uh, sword. Um, and so he is, he is mocking himself and, and thereby sort of casting off uh, Wagner's influence. And yet, the whole idea of this of this blending of the modern and the mythic uh, in Ulysses, I think, undoubtedly owes something to Wagner and and Joyce read Wagner's writings very carefully, as, as well as sort of uh, listening to the operas. He was himself, of course, a very musical, deeply musical uh, person, and and so uh, it, it is kind of a, a reversal, uh, a rejection of Wagner, and at the same time. Uh, 
it, it is uh, a, a, a work that's kind of uh, infiltrated everywhere by Wagner uh, references and fitting its wake uh, even more so. Uh, Virginia Woolf was, was was sort of constantly vacillating, and I think she she had a a more a more distant relationship with Wagner, but still a significant one. I think a significant one, and and um, and she went to to Bayreuth, the only one of this group who who went to Bayreuth, and and was deeply deeply moved by Parsifal. And so I think you can you can see a sort of a, 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 a fainter but but still palpable uh, shadow of Parsifal in in the waves, especially. Yes. And it is one of the um, contradictions inherent in Wagner is, is that in his own time, he was a, a radical and a, a modernist, a political radical, radical and friend of anarchists in his early life and uh, and certainly a German nationalist. But that was quite a radical position, too, because it was anti-monarchist and it was it was after building a, a united Germany. Um, uh, and yet, uh, of course, he was a Victorian and he died well in, inside what we call the Victorian era, at least the 19th century. Uh, and... And so seems unmodern to 20th century eyes, and yet is still a modernist or a modernist influence. That's to say, he doesn't get covered in the thick brown varnish that, I don't know, Tennyson and uh, Carlyle and Matthew Arnold and, you know, sort of vic really Victorian figures with big whiskers uh, are, are dismissed by the Bloomsburyites and by other modernists and, and by the Jazz Age. And, 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 and Wagner carries on he carries on being an influence and it, it, it's um it's it's a peculiar thing how someone like Stravinsky for example whom you can see connected to the jazz age that's very fragmented and spiky the music very sharp and broken up and uh, got that very sort of modernist feel seems so completely opposite to Wagner and yet they 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 you know they were still there was still an option of going the Wagnerian way right up through Schoenberg, who was uh, Wagnerian in his early years enormously, wasn't he? Yeah. You know, one thing I decided not to do in this book, to sort of keep the whole thing uh, a little bit under control, was, was really not to address Wagner's influence on, on subsequent music, which is, of course, a huge topic in itself. And the, the book, you know, would have been, you know, uh, yes, 18 big. Instead of <laughs> Wagnerian. On that. <laughs> And also, it was, it's it's because he had such a strong effect outside of music that that this this phenomenon is so remarkable, really. Because you know, inside music, he was of course very influential. Uh, was he more influential than Monteverdi or or Bach or or Beethoven or Stravinsky himself? I don't know. You know, he was one of a of a series of, of figures who seemed to sort of shift uh, all of musical language. Uh, Probably in, was on film composing. It's worth saying his particular yeah yeah yeah. Course, yeah. Um, yeah, but it, but just, you know, with, it's it's the cultural influence that that, yeah. that is in part. But nonetheless, yes, I mean the the relationship, you know, in a way, you know, Stravinsky's loud, brusque uh, rejection of Wagner sort of falls somewhat in the same category as there are some of these literary uh, modernist uh, figures, and and you know, nonetheless, uh, Stravinsky knew his. Wagner, um, and he went to Bayreuth with Diaghilev and and Nijinsky. Uh, Diaghilev was was completely infatuated by by uh, Wagner uh, his whole uh, life, um, uh, right up to the end. Um, and uh, Nijinsky was was found Wagner very interesting. So you know, Stravinsky, I think, felt compelled to just sort of you know cut ties uh, completely. You know, and yet it's very interesting that that right before one week before the premiere of the Rite of Spring was the 100th anniversary of Wagner's birth. Uh, and so the, the Paris periodicals were, were full of talk of this anniversary and recounting the famous Tannhäuser scandal of 1861. And it's perhaps not a coincidence that, that Diaghilev uh, chose to more or less stage uh, this, the great you know, Rite of Spring scandal at exactly uh, this moment and with, with uh, French writers and publications saying that Stravinsky was the new Wagner in the sense that, that he, he was sort of this, this scandalous uh, you know, avant-gardist uh, who was sort of once again uh, revolutionizing music. And, and so, you know, despite uh, uh, all of the kind of, you know, outer signals there, there still is, you know, even with a figure as seemingly distant mm -hmm. uh, as these, these, these ties. 
much more obviously in the case of Schoenberg, who, who really adored Wagner and, 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 and revered him and, and was deeply influenced by his orchestration uh, in his early period and, and always found him a, a useful uh, 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 point of reference and, and saw his own sort of uh, move into atonality as the completion of a process that had begun with... with yeah, yeah. Um, and so moving on now, this might seem like special pleading, but I think it's so interesting that I hope people don't think it is. We're both, as it happens, gay men, I think. And uh, your, your chapter on, on the, the, the gay world of Wagner, why it is that Wagner appeals to gay people, why it was almost a code for uh, in, in the days when, when being gay was a completely illegal uh, thing, um, why it was a code. People who knew that, oh, you like Wagner, do you? W. H. Orton used to say that he is he so does he like yeah. you know? <laughs> what, yeah, so be a it's yeah. Or sort of probably, it's probably easier to see why the um, the lesbian community might find so much fun in the you know Valkyries and things without being too stereotyped. You know what I mean? It's a very kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but I, I, I wonder why there is this side, of, and is that indeed a window into the transgressive nature of Wagner generally, or the, the sense of you know why outsiders go to him of both left and right and of different sexualities? Is, is that all part of the Wagner mystery? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this was um, a, a sort of this this idea that Wagner was a a figure of sexual transgression and somehow. Um, uh, sort of uh, friendly to or, or an ally mm -hmm. of those who are following sexually unconventional paths. It's, it's, it's a very important uh, strain of this whole phenomenon and one that I think was, was overlooked for quite a long time uh, until there was a very important book that came out a few years ago by Lawrence Dreyfus uh, about sort of Wagner and uh, the erotic impulse, uh, which sort of you know, brought a lot of this back up to the surface. But Susan Sontag and others have talked about it. But yeah, when you look at the late 19th century, this was, this was a, a constant topic. Um, and Wagner really became uh, a symbol uh, for the nascent uh, gay rights uh, movement. He was, he was seen at the very least as an ally. Some people thought that he was gay himself or, or sort of homoerotically inclined. Um, and there were these, uh, there was a, a questionnaire from the turn of the century sort of designed to uh, help young people figure out, you know, you know, were they, were they gay? Were they earning? Um, and one of the questions was, are you peculiarly fond of Wagner? <laughs> <I'll take this laughs> um, and, and this made perfect sense because, you know, Wagner, there was a side to Wagner that, that was, that was friendly to, to all of this, you know, I mean, he, 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 there are passages of his writings, which, which have this homoerotic tinge. Uh, he, he did have this, this fetish almost um, for uh, soft, uh, silky garments, which could be seen as a, almost as a form of, of uh, cross-dressing. And all this was exposed in the public arena um, in the uh, 1870s in a way that was quite shocking to him personally, um, uh, and really just a remarkable instance of sort of a, a figure of such, you know, towering significance um, uh, being being attacked for his sort of uh, sexual uh, peccadilloes. Um, and, you know, just from his private utterances, we know that, that he had no problem with, with having gay men uh, around him. And uh, there's a remarkable moment in the diaries where Cosma Wagner is talking about their friend, Paul von Yukovsky, who uh, designed the sets for Parsifal. And he was showing up with his uh, Italian lover, Peppino. And, and Cosma said something like, this is ridiculous. This is, this is absurd, sort of something kind of dismissive. And, and Wagner said, this is something for which I have understanding, but no inclination, um, which is, you know, a quite progressive comment. I'm immense. Um, they, they both teased Nietzsche with the possibility that he might be. Gay. Well, yes, and, yeah, there was and an, an over masturbator as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's all. Read rumors about the post. Yeah, strange ideas about sexuality, but, but the point was, I think there was a sort of atmosphere around the Wagner's mm. uh, that was that was welcoming. Uh, mm. to uh, gay men and, and uh, lesbians uh, a little later. And so by the turn of the century, Bayreuth was seen as a kind of um, 
a watering hole for, for uh, uh, gay people, a place where you could feel a little more comfortable and be a little more open. And then there was the fact that the, the son, Siegfried, was uh, gay himself. So there was sort of an entourage around him. And this sort of advanced from the public eye uh, uh, sufficiently that, that it was written about. You know, there, there was a, a, an essay by the uh, extraordinary playwright and, and polemicist Oscar Panizza uh, called Bayreuth and Homosexuality. Uh, and so it was sort of you know, brought, out, brought out into the, into the uh, open. And, uh, and it was part of this, this remarkable phase in Germany at the end of the 19th century where modern gay rights was coming into being among Miss Hirschfeld and the magazine Der Eigene. And, and Wagner was a, was a topic uh, um, in these uh, circles um, and a sort of a, a, a topic of interest. Um, and, and so this, this idea emerged that, uh, that yes, Wagner was, was almost a, a code word. He was part of the, the, the canon of, of gay taste. Um, Which is fascinating because you think there it is, Wagner and the immediate aftermath, uh, you know, following Wagner's death, this sense that he was a kind of crown prince of Bohemia with his crushed velvet beret and, and as you say, his silk clothes and a style, a high doctrine of art such as no one had ever had, even higher probably than Oscar Wilde's and a, a real sense of, 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 of a complete belief as art and aesthetics as a kind of religion, as a way forward, as a way of, uh, of, of mediating the world and a way of understanding the world and as a vocation that is supreme above mm -hmm. all others. That this somehow came also the Stuart Chamberlain and the, 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 the fascists started to, to take it over. There, there was a peculiar period then when Wagnerism moved away from being a high art and beauty and license and freedom and, uh, and, and became instead something that was rigidly uh, uh, connected with pan-Germanism and other such things. And, yeah, know, yeah. And all this was happening together. I mean, sort of yes, this, this so of, of the decadent Wagner and the bohemian Wagner and this kind of uh, uh, free uh, atmosphere at Bayreuth. And, and Bayreuth was also a very cosmopolitan place. And sort of the other irony, of course, is the Wagner family became progressively less German <laughs> as the years went by because, you know, Cosima herself was completely non-German. Uh, she was a French-Hungarian woman. And that was commented upon. People, thought, people said after Wagner's death, why is this French-Hungarian uh, woman uh, sort of running our, our great German national festival? Um, and then the son, uh, Siegfried, uh, marries Winifred uh, Wagner, uh, a British orphan, uh, and Houston Stewart Chamberlain uh, marries into the family, marries the daughter, uh, Ava. Uh, and so it's, <laughs> you know, once you get to the 1930s, the, the grandsons are, are you know, one, one quarter German. Um, and yet, you know, this, this, this urge to, to, uh, to nationalize uh, Bayreuth, uh, especially sort of right before the First World War, I think, uh, Chamberlain has married into the family, uh, Cosima, uh, uh, an extraordinary woman uh, who I always think is a bit underserved uh, by, the, by the extant uh, literature. She had many, many dark and difficult qualities, but she was also just, just, you know, she created this festival, you know, she made it an institution. She was also a theatrical uh, director, so very conservative in her taste, but, but she was a, a woman of unusual power um, in, in the artistic arena at that time. But uh, she steps away, um, and, and so the, the, the whole operation is nationalized, and by the time it reopens in 1924, it is more or less Nazified, or sort of well on the way to being Nazified, and this, this is this strikes me so much. This complexity of you know, on the one hand, you have this ever broadening, uh, cultural, uh, sort of proliferating set of sort of, of competing images of Wagner and Wagnerism and his influence. But at the same time, this this ideological narrowing uh, is taking place, and the and the right wing uh, is 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 ever more assertive and ever more persuasive in terms of how it's appropriating. Wagner as against this tradition of left-wing Wagnerism, which was really flourishing in the, in the late 19th century. And, and, you know, George Bernard Shaw's perfect Wagner. Yeah, 
number. Yeah, and so many uh, German and Austrian uh, social democrats and uh, communists, uh, socialists, uh, anarchists, you know, every, every uh, Jean Jaurès in, in, in France. Um, Wagner was a hero of the left and right into the 1920s, in sort of early Bolshevik period uh, in, in Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. Wagner was a name to conjure with, but the, but the right wing in, in Germany uh, wins the argument in the end, really, and and they yeah. and they they still you know win the argument today. I mean, this the the fact of 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 the left Wagner and leftist Wagnerism uh, just comes as a surprise to to many people because you know we've been so uh, conditioned to think of Wagner first and foremost as the proto Nazi uh, composer, as Hitler's uh, favorite composer, and so on. So exactly. So it. that Siegfried <laughs> becomes a Blondarian and Mima becomes a, yeah, a, a, yeah. a Jew, and it's, it's very hard to kick those out of your mind, isn't it, as images? Mm -hmm. But it's worth rem remembering, too, isn't it, that Hitler, most people feel that Hitler barely knew Wagner's work, didn't really understand it. His favorite piece was the Rienzi Overture, which is a kind of blast of martial, uh, yeah. kind of wonderfully overdone and brilliant of course and yeah. Yeah, he made people work. he made his soldiers i mean his you know his his nearest in command every nuremberg they had to sit through the meister singer and got terribly bored and would leave in the interval yeah. and make him cross but i mean Wagner did know uh, hitler did know wagner well i mean there's no disputing that uh, he he had a kind of he had a, a a memory that sort of allowed him to. He was, he was very good at sort of memorizing things uh, quickly, and 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 he would impress uh, sort of tried and true Wagnerians with his uh, detailed mm -hmm. uh, knowledge of the librettos and and the score. And you know there there was a sort of a a, a show offy kind of uh, 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 element to this. He he would sort of use this this memory of his to to sort of basically um, present himself as as far like, more omniscient. Maybe. You know, whether it was sort of military plans or whatever it was. Um, um, but it was, you know, I mean, it was a deep lifelong love of his. You know, what I tried to point out about, about Hitler is that he fell in love with the music, I think, well before he had any particular political ideas. You know, he was a, a teenager uh, in Linz and he saw Lohengrin and he saw Rienzi and he was swept away. And this was a completely unremarkable experience for sort of someone of that generation. Again, this was the generation where you, you just, you know, millions of, of people uh, were, you know, had those sort of moments of, of sort of teenage infatuation. Um, and it's, it's only later, you know, as Hitler's politics are radicalized at the end of the First World War, that this, this fusion begins to happen between um, Wagner's art um, and the emergent, you know, political mission of yeah. of uh, Hitler and and the Nazi party party, and it was it was never a perfect fusion, you know. I mean, yes, Wagner was was very widely used as a propaganda symbol in Nazi Germany, um, but there were problems. Uh, there were aspects of of Wagner that had to be concealed uh, and covered up in order to sort of have him work um, in this fashion, and you know, Wagner's own politics were were highly confused and, and at times he could sound like a complete anarchist and, and sort of reject the very idea of the organized state. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, nations, the German nation shouldn't have a standing army, which is you know, an idea that sort of the totalitarian, totalitarian state can, uh, totalitarian state can readily embrace. Um, and so, and so you, you know, I think any political appropriation, whether on the left or the right, sort of had to sort of do some airbrushing, you know, of, of, of Wagner's uh, politics. Yes, um, I mean, after so, all, if you wanted to give a, a sort of potted uh, description of what the ring means, one, the most obvious thing you would say is that love and power cannot coexist. Uh, uh, yeah, which is why, you know, you power know, work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you just have to wonder why, you know, if, you know, if, if Hitler was so infatuated with Wagner, um, you know, how did this sort of fundamental critique yeah. of power, in, did, did he ever sort of have any grasp of this, you know? Yes, that's what I meant, exactly, yes. Yeah. It's it's part of all, the strain of pacifism. Uh, in in Parsifal and the and the cult of of compassion was something sort of diametrically opposed to to sort of the the sort of 
Nazi uh, ideology, especially once once the war uh, began, and, and and Germans were explicitly explicitly warned um, not to uh, indulge feelings of pity. And the same word "mitleid" was was used. That that sort of uh, is the kind of you know uh, idee fixe of of Parsifal. And so and so yeah, this 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 composer is is so complex and so contradictory that sort of any any political ma manipulation of him must involve a simplification. But this is not to say <clears throat> that, that Wagner was somehow the innocent victim you know, of such manipulations because there are very clear uh, lines of connection from his own ideology to Nazi ideology, anti-Semitism above all, but also the, the strident uh, nationalism uh, mm -hmm. and, and chauvinism. And so it was, this was not an unfortunate accident <laughs> you know, that happened to him. Um, and the, uh, the remarkable formulation that I always turn to comes from Thomas Mann, who for me is sort of the ultimate Wagnerian uh, mm -hmm. because he was deeply passionate about the music and at the same time, deeply ambivalent and acutely aware of, of, of the, the, the problems attendant uh, on Wagner in, in German uh, culture and history. But what he said was that uh, uh, Wagner lent himself to his own exploitation, to his own yep. misuse. Um, and it's a beautiful formulation because on the one hand, it acknowledges that, that there is a misuse, a distortion, a simplification going on in, in the so-called Nazi Wagner. But it is a process to which Wagner lends himself. It is a process in which he uh, has participated. Um, and yes, I he made himself that, a hostage to a fortune that was yeah, terrible. Yeah. And and yeah. It's a tragic flaw. And for anyone who loves Wagner's music, it's just endlessly dismaying that someone who has such a a vast vision of 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 humanity and and a sort of the, the sort of human psychology and and sort of this, the whole kind of history of human culture. He was a, he was a lavishly well read man, uh, sort of you know, uh, who drew on you know, so many different uh, influences and, and inspirations. But when it came to the anti-Semitism, when it came to the German chauvinism, uh, he was so absolutely. Uh, 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 hemmed in, you know, by his, by his bigotry, by, by sort of the limits of his vision. And you just wish, could there have just been some moment, you know, at which he had, he had sort of stepped back and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, asked whether, whether sort of this was the right path to take, but he didn't. He was, it was an utter obsession with him right to the end. It was. Um, and and what, is, I'd, I'd love to end with the thought of the 21st century, um, which we see crumbling civilization crumbling around us at least it can feel like that uh, not just the pandemic but uh, all kinds of other things seem to have given a lot of us the idea that that, that we have come to a time of uh, quite alarming uh, quite alarming contingency and fragility in what in things that we used to regard as solid in terms of you know, uh, outlook and indeed a rise in nativist nationalism, uh, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, we can see in, in the earlier 20th century. I wondered what you felt Wagner's legacy uh, can teach the 21st century and might, uh, what do you fear about it? Might he be appropriated again or um, is, is he no longer relevant to, to, to politicians in the way that he could have been in the 20th century? Yeah, well, this is this is obviously something I've I've thought a lot about, and and uh, sort of toward the end of the, the book, I, I make this theme almost central. Sort of, you know, what can we learn from this case of Wagner in in our own uh, dangerous political moment? You know, in terms of Wagner's abiding presence on the right wing and among uh, neo Nazis and white supremacists, it is he, it is still there. You know, he is still present um, as a point of reference. It is. He is not a significant factor from, from you know, what, what I was able to see uh, scouring some, some sort of rather ugly corners of the, of the internet. You know, I mean, the, these, these nativist movements now and, and neo-Nazism and neo-fascism and all the rest, you know, they draw so much on popular culture, you know, um, and, and sort of this is the weapon that they wield. Um, and if you look at uh, uh, Donald Trump, you know, this, he, he's a figure who comes from American popular culture in so many ways with the, 
the you know the uh, reality TV and the beauty pageants and, and professional wrestling and all this stuff. And he, and he plays, you know, rock songs. He plays the Rolling Stones uh, at his rallies. Not Wagner. Um, he can't stand <laughs> Wagner. We know that from uh, Tina Brown's diaries. Uh, in fact, um, and and you know the Rolling Stones may not want him to be playing their song, right. but but it, this 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 these are the some of the weapons that, that that he deploys and i think that's the case for a number of other um uh, authoritarians around the world now and and i think this is kind of the more oblique lesson that we can learn uh, i think it's not so much that that we sort of look at wagner as sort of an active present danger i think that's almost a kind of easy way out to say that oh all of this sort of somehow goes back to wagner and he's sort of the, the root of, of all evil and that's that's a, that's a, a complete cop out you know i mean there's sort of so many other sort of cultural uh, uh kind of connections that we need to look at and, but i think we can sort of you know for, for speaking as an american i think well, we can look at how our popular culture and and how sort of uh, american art and culture has played a role um in white supremacy in this nativism in this whole kind of project of sort of american global hegemony, you know, and, and popular culture has been has been a weapon intentionally or not. Um, and and so this is this is the, the kind of lesson I think we can learn from from studying Wagner. And also I think the the, the whole sort of you know the, the how Wagner is performed and staged these days is very often a, a good lesson in how we can, you know, instead of just putting him completely to the side um, uh, and saying, we're just not gonna have anything to do anymore with this with this ugly artist. Instead, confront it uh, directly, put it on stage, talk about it, write about it, analyze it uh, and, and learn something from it. And you know, I, I know that the, the contemporary way of staging Wagner drives a lot of people up the wall and you know, they would prefer just to see the Valkyries and the swords and the magic ring and so on. But I think this, you know, in the case of Wagner above all, uh, this kind of uh, confrontational and, 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 and reinventive and kind of revisionary uh, style is, is important. And that shows us you know how to how to deal with with uh, a figure like this. You know, and 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 I think this whole there's just been incredibly rich um, uh, 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 sort of history now uh, of sort of post-war, sort of post-Nazi uh, wrestling with these with these questions with some sort of just remarkable artistic statements as as a result. So I think you know this should go on. Uh, we can't get rid of Wagner. I personally don't want to get rid of Wagner, as as you don't, and and and, I mean, and even still. So, 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 Part of musical history. I mean, you know, so, you can't play a I mean, they, they, yeah. playing Wagner. You know, it's, they, you know, <laughs> the production sell out instantly, don't they? When a new opera house does an, a ring, an opera house does a new ring, it's it sells out instantly. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 you know, people make their living, you know, singing Wagner and playing Wagner, and so and so it's and and, and you know we just can't. I mean, the, the last thing I would say is you know as important it is always to be conscious of this, of this connection with, with Nazism and Hitler, um, there's a point at which it becomes too uh, overpowering. Um, and when, when it gets to the point where this is now sort of the one thing that a lot of people know about Wagner, that is, that is a loss um, because there is so much more um, to this artist. And there are so many people uh, who are Jewish, uh, who are very aware of these issues and, and nonetheless have, have come to uh, an understanding and appreciation of the, of the composer. And I think it, it, uh, it's just, it, it's, we need to, to approach this with a spirit of, of we're not gonna have all the answers. You know, there's not gonna be a simple answer uh, at, the, at the end of the story. It's, it's not gonna be guilty or, or not guilty. You know, it, it asks us to be patient with complexity and contradiction and, and nuance, which is never a popular <laughs> request <laughs> to make. People, people prefer to have the, the, uh, the, the clear and precise answer, but th this, is, this is where we are left with. with Absolutely. With the controversy goes on. The meanings proliferate, and and we sort of write the next chapter of the story. Absolutely, that's brilliant, Alex. Alex I should call you Alex Mein Ross, shouldn't I, in a Wagnerian way, having having to share your name with the steed. Um, 
it, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, and I, I urge people to go and uh, uh, find the book, Wagnerism. It's, it's a magnificent read. Uh, apart from anything else, it teaches one so much about cultural history of, of the last 150 years. It's absolutely uh, unputdownable. So uh, I want to thank Alex very much for this and thank the RPS. Incidentally, in 1855, uh, Wagner came and conducted at the uh, Philharmonic Society, as it then was. I think it was before it was royal. Um, so there's a good connection with that. Um, and and Thomas Anheuser, uh, yeah. the request in Victoria. <laughs> exactly. So thank you to all, all of you for coming and do consider supporting or becoming a member of the, uh, of the, Philharmonic Society, the Royal Philharmonic Society. Um, it, it's doing terrific work uh, for musicians and for the spreading of musical ideas around, around the country and the world. So um, uh, Alex, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your slightly longer day in New York and uh, good evening to everyone here in, in the UK. Bye-bye. So much. Thank you so much. A pleasure.